Thank you for joining my presentation on Medical Marijuana Risk Benefits Profile. Is it safe? I was asked to put this presentation together for a group of advanced practice nurses who were looking to prescribe or utilize uh, medical cannabis on their patients, and they really wanted to get a good handle on the risk benefits of uh, cannabis. So this presentation is based on the most current evidence that's out there on the benefits and also the risk of medical cannabis, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. My name is Terrence Shenfield, and I received my second master's in complementary and alternative medicine with a focus of herbal medicine and essential oils, as well as um, food science. I know a lot about cannabis I, because it's a plant and because I studied botany, I got a good handle for this. So uh, the combination of understanding plants and also being a medical educator for the last 30 years has helped me put this presentation together. I am a resident of Pennsylvania. I live in East Stroudsburg. I moved up here because I love to ski. Uh, that's just a little information. But I wanted to put together a list of Pennsylvania qualifying conditions for medical marijuana. There are 23 different conditions. So I just want you to think about this. Um, the state of Pennsylvania has found it prudent to offer medical marijuana for 23 different medical conditions. So I am sure they looked at the risk benefits of cannabis use and I just want to list some of them. Um, ALS, autism, cancer, Crohn's disease, epilepsy, sickle cell anemia, multiple sclerosis, uh, neuropathies, opioid use disorder, which um, we're going to be speaking about during this lecture, post-traumatic stress disorder, HIV, inflammatory bowel disease. As you can see, there's a host of different types of illnesses that medical marijuana is useful. And you wonder, how does one plant work on so many different disorders? And that is one of the uh, key characteristics of Mother Nature's um, medicine. Uh, these plants are not synthesized in the lab. They are actually quite complex. And there are different breeds of plants, like certain plants have high THC or low THC or high CBD and low, some have equal amounts. As a result of that, they impact different parts of the body. And I'll get a little bit more into that as we go along. But these are the qualifying conditions that medical marijuana uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, and it's pretty similar to other states' um, qualifying conditions. In today's presentation, the following objectives of hope to be met. I'm going to describe what is the endocannabinoid system. I'm going to identify common adverse effects of medical cannabis use. I'm going to identify contraindications to medical cannabis use. I'm going to talk about the interaction of medical cannabis with other drugs. And then I'm going to talk about certain parts, certain systems in the body, how it impacts it, such as your respiratory system, your cardiovascular system, your immune system, your reproductive system, and so on. So um, this is going to be a pretty comprehensive uh, lecture on medical cannabis risk benefits. Let me give you a short background on cannabis. Cannabis um, has two main strains. I believe there's one other strain, but let's talk about the two ones that are very common. And those are indigo and sativa. Both of these strains, uh, the plant appears a little bit different in regard to indigo. The plant is typically short and sort of really wide and stout. Uh, where cannabis sativa is typically long and narrow. Uh, but, you know, these are still the cannabis plant, and both of these plants actually contain uh, many different cannabinoids. When I use the word cannabinoids, those are the chemical constituents in the plant, and instead of calling them chemical constituents, they call them cannabinoids. Some well-known cannabinoids you might know about is THC, that's one of the cannabinoids, CBD is another. So when you think about cannabis, really you should be thinking about 
at least from a medical point of view, is the ratio of THC to CBD. This is ultimately very important. For example, uh, if you have a, any kind of seizure disorder, you need a plant that's high CBD, low THC. If you're in like a lot of chronic pain, you might want an equal ratio of THC to CBD. And there are different, a host of different types of medical conditions that benefit from the ratio of these cannabinoids. So understanding the ratio is ultimately very important in managing the disease process. If you ever had a prescription for medical marijuana and you went to a dispensary and you went there and looked at the, the variety of plants, and remember, when I say variety, they're all cannabis, but what's important is the ratio of THC to CBD. As medical providers, as people who are trained in medicine, we really should be only focused about the ratio of THC to CBD. And I feel that the cannabis industry does themselves a disservice when they name things like Blue Dream, Purple Cindy, Mango Sour, because they really take away, they almost like uh, make it look like it's a fine wine or a whiskey rather than the medicine that it really is. So I think they do a disservice to the community. And what's really important is to understand the ratio. Also at these centers where they have dispensaries, I believe the person who's behind the counter who's selling you these products should be a pharmacist. I think they should be trained in understanding the ratio of the cannabinoids in the plant and what kind of conditions can benefit from that ratio. So uh, I think these names more or less apply to a recreational user. And I'm afraid to say that some people go to medical doctors to get a cannabis prescription only to sort of use it recreationally. So from I'm a little bit biased. I like the I like the ratios. I'm a little bit, you know, medically background and I just feel when I see purple Cindy, Blue Dream, Mango Sour, I just think, oh my goodness, this is all about the recreational user. Let's talk about the cannabis plants and its constituents or its cannabinoids. Cannabis is a polypharmaceutical substance. What that means is there is over 108 different identified cannabinoids in the plant. As a result of that, the plant has many medical benefits. You may be looking at that list of 23 um, diagnoses that medical cannabis could be used on, and you, they are a host of different disorders. And the reason why cannabis works is because it's such a complex molecule. Like I said, it contains over 108 cannabinoids. Uh, the most well-studied cannabinoids is THC and CBD. The cannabis plant also has what is known as terpenoids. Terpenoids are basically these aromatic organic compounds found in many plants. An example of a terpenoid is an essential oil. So what gives the scent of an essential oil like lavender or rose or peppermint is the terpenoids. And the terpenoids in the cannabis plant, uh, they identify like uh, at least five main ones, pinene, limonene, myrcene, and um, beta carophylline and all of these terpenoids actually have a, it gives the plant a certain scent a certain taste and at the same time it has some additional medical benefits just the way an essential oil would i don't want to get more into this whole topic because i could talk the whole conference about terpenoids but this is what terpenoids are and um, even though there's 108 cannabinoids identified in the plant, there's over 400 and other, 420 other constituents in the plant, and you're doing research on this as we talk. Part of the problem with research is cannabis is a Schedule One drug. Because it's illegal, no one can really do much research with it. Um, they're starting to do more research now, but you know they lightened up their rules with this, but that's why. Also think about it, pharmaceutical companies will not want to invest 
in research in a cannabis plant that could be grown in your backyard. So they want to make it in the test tube. They want to make their own send things synthetically. So they're not pouring a lot of money into research either. So you might be asking yourself, who is Raphael Machulam? Raphael Machulam is an Israeli scientist who is considered the godfather of medical marijuana. Raphael Machulam was born in Bulgaria in the 1930s and then immigrated with his family to Israel in 1949. He studied chemistry and then received his PhD, which had a thesis on the chemistry of steroids. After postdoctoral studies at the Rockefeller Institute in New York, he was on scientific staff at the Wiseman Institute. He's also a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He moved back to Israel. And actually, he's a major scientific studier of the chemistry and pharmacology of cannabinoids. And some interesting statement. I am sure all of you have heard of THC and you've all heard of CBD. Which one did you hear about first? I'm sure like many of us, you heard about THC. But actually, cannabidiol, CBD, was first identified by Raphael Machulam back in the 1960s. And when you really think about the plant, the medical marijuana plant, the two major constituents or chemicals in the plant, which today call cannabinoids, is THC and CBD. There are other cannabinoids, but CBD and THC are the most. And when you look at the percentage, the cannabis plant has almost 40% of CBD, cannabidiol, and a lower percentage of THC. So Raphael Machulam is still alive. He's in Israel. He's a pioneer in the research of medical marijuana. And you got to remember, in the United States, marijuana is considered a Schedule One drug. As a result of that, there's not much research being done on it because it's illegal. But in Israel, they don't consider marijuana a Schedule One drug, and the research has been carried out for years. So Israel, as a country, is probably a world leader in cannabis research. And this high guy, Raphael Machulam, is considered a godfather. He's got a big research center, and they do some great research in Israel. And if you ever want to look up his name, he's like a um, wonderful guy. So let's talk more about the CB1 and CB2 receptors. The CB1 receptor is mostly found in the brain and peripheral nervous system. The CB2 receptor is found mostly in our gut and also our immune system. It's on most of our T cells, B cells. So it has a very, very important part in immunity and also has a very, very part for inflammatory diseases and processes. So let me just say something. When you think about cannabis, people get high on cannabis. And the reason for that is THC has a strong affinity for the CB1 receptor site. And the CB1 receptor site is located in the brain. So it impacts memory, it impacts coordination, and that is why you feel high. The CB2 receptors as I was saying before, are mostly located in the immune system and gut. And a lot of times, if you use cannabis product, it's good for irritable bowel syndrome because the irritable bowel syndrome is part of the gut. And actually, there's so much knowledge out there that the CB2 receptors are very involved with inflammation processes in the body, and like irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and also arthritis and we'll get more into that. So CB1 in the brain and peripheral nervous system, CB2 is in our immune system as well as our gut. This is a very important slide because it talks about the endocannabinoid system. And you may be wondering, what is the endocannabinoid system? The endocannabinoid system was identified by Dr. Raphael Machulam, and basically, all mammals on this planet have an endocannabinoid system. It's just not humans. Every type of mammal on the planet has it. And basically, it's a receptor system where 
in the body, you have two types of receptors besides every other type of receptor you have. And one is called CB1 and the other one is called CB2. And the CB1 receptor is predominantly in the brain and the peripheral nervous system, where the CB2 receptors are part of the immune system, and it's also part of the gut. Um, our bodies, so we have these receptor systems, receptor systems, CB1, CB2, but our bodies produce these two natural chemicals or hormones, and it's very similar to the prostaglandin type of molecule. The molecule that we produce and chemical we produce, one is called ananamide and the other one is called 2-AG. These two chemicals or hormones attach to the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So what you're saying, what is the function of the CB1, CB2 receptors? They actually influence every type of physiologic system in the body, memory, pain, hunger, feeling full, inflammatory processes, pain processes, the list goes on and on, immunity, it goes on and on. So when we produce enough anandamide and we produce enough 2-AG, it actually attaches to the CB1 receptor, CB2 receptors, and then we are in homeostasis. As we get older, anandamide and 2-AG is produced less. Think of the diabetic. Sometimes, you know, when people, uh, they're not born a diabetic, but over the years, they don't produce enough insulin. Maybe they even turn into type 1 diabetes. So how do you treat that? You have to give, you have to give insulin externally. Now, the funny part about ananamide and 2-AG and how it fits into the CB1 and CB2 receptors, THC, the molecule of THC is almost perfectly adapted to fit into the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Not any other type of chemicals can fit into these receptors, so it's kind of amazing that the THC molecule is molecularly shaped just like a nanomite and 2-AG. So the premise is, if you don't produce enough anandamide and 2-AG, you could supplement yourself with THC, which will fit right into those CB1, CB2 receptors and elicit some kind of physiologic response. I'll get more into this, but that is the basis of that. In regard to CBD, CBD does not attach to the CB1 or CB2 receptors, but what it does do when ananamide and 2-AG actually break down, they have um, enzymatic breakdown, they CBD prevents it from being broken down, so more or less encourages it to last longer and do its thing. So we'll get more into that a little bit later. I wanted to tell you something about endocannabinoid deficiency. And what endocannabinoid deficiency is, is as we get older, as we get chronic diseases, our bodies produce less natural endogenous cannabinoids, ananamide and 2-AG. They believe that a lot of inflammatory processes and a lot of chronic diseases is caused by a deficiency in those two cannabinoids. So the goal would be to supplement our bodies with um, artificial endogenous cannabinoids that come from the cannabis plant. And that's a whole lecture in itself. So there is a term, it's called endocannabinoid deficiency, and it has a lot to do with the fact that our bodies don't produce enough ananamide and 2-AG, which is used to maintain homeostasis. And that's a whole lecture in itself. This is a chart that shows the cannabis safety profile. And I wanted to talk about the active lethal dose ratio and dependence of potential for psychoactive drugs. So basically, they looked at a whole host of psychoactive drugs, and they find that medical marijuana has a moderate to low uh, dependence factor. Also, from a point of having a lethal dose, no one has ever died of an overdose of marijuana. But you can see on the far right, people have died of heroin, people have died of morphine, people have died of cocaine, even alcohol ingestion. So from this chart, you can really see that marijuana is really um, not deadly, number one, and also it's not that 
You don't build a dependence on it. Actually, studies have shown if you do become dependent, it's around 9%. So 91% of the population who use cannabis don't have any kind of dependence, but 9% do. And if you do have a dependence, uh, sometimes uh, the most severe effect of stopping cannabis is that you have sleep disorders. So that's a whole nother lecture. But so the bottom line, marijuana has a pretty safe profile in this regard. Let's talk about some common adverse effects of medical marijuana. For example, anxiety. Anxiety is caused by cannabis strains that have a high THC, low CBD. So if you get cannabis and you don't know exactly what you're taking, that what can make you paranoid. That can give you anxiety. So the ratio of THC to CBD is very important. You get dry mouth, you get redden eyes, and the reason for the redden eyes is that it's a vasodilator. So cannabis has vasodilatory effects, and which causes the red eyes. You could get bronchitis. Bronchitis is caused by when you inhale cannabis, especially if you smoke it in a pipe or what they call a joint. And when that hot smoke gets into the lungs, it actually burns the little cilia. The cilia are these little wave-like features inside the lung that um, push the mucus up and out of your mouth. So basically, when you use cannabis, even tobacco smoke, and the hot smoke actually dampens the effect of the cilia, which causes, um, again, bronchitis. Sedation can cause from plants that have high THC. Um, you may have visual changes. You might have an altered sense of time because, you know, it impacts the CB1 receptors. Uh, basically, you could have ataxia, dysphoria. Uh, you could have cough. And they've had some studies where there were decreased sperm counts with the use of cannabis plants. I'm going to get a lot more into a lot of details about each and every one of these and even some other stuff that you may have never known about. As you know, when you take any kind of uh, drug in your body, that drug is metabolized most of the time by the liver. And the liver has this system called the P450 enzymatic system, which is responsible for the metabolism of drugs. So basically, just like any other drug, when you take cannabis, it is actually metabolized in the liver by the P450 enzyme system. Um, what this means is if you're on other types of medications, it could impact the effect of that medication. So if you're on a beta blocker, it could impact it. So here's what I'm trying to say. Um, these, poor, these P450 enzyme systems are either classified as an inhibitor or an inducer. An inducing agent can increase the rate of another's drug's metabolism, therefore impacting its therapeutic dose where an inhibitor decreases a drug's metabolism and can cause an increase in the drug therapeutic level and the possibility in harmful or adverse effects. So bottom line, just like any other drug, um, aspirin, Tylenol, you know, penicillin, anything, they're all metabolized in the liver. And the enzymatic system responsible for that is a P450. So when you use cannabis, it could impact the metabolism of other drugs you take. Your doctor may prescribe other drugs to you, and the cannabis plant will actually impact the metabolism of those other drugs, either increasing the effect of the drug or decreasing the effect of the drug. They did some studies where THC and CBD are metabolized by two different systems. One is called the CYP3A4, and the other one is the CYP2C9. So those are the two enzymatic systems that are used in metabolism of drugs, especially with cannabis. And we're going to get a little bit more into it. I just needed to give you a little primer on that. As can be seen by this slide, I am talking about the interaction of the cannabis plant and more importantly, the cannabinoids in the plant and how they impact drugs that you may be taking. 
So for example, THC can decrease serum concentrations of clozapine, uh, naproxen, uh, cyclobenzaprine, uh, halperidol. So the THC can actually make the effectiveness of these drugs decrease. Where CBD increases the serum co um, concentration of macrolides, calcium channel blockers, benzodiapines, uh, sinidophil, antihistamines. So there's a whole host of drugs that um, CBD will increase the effect of. Uh, also, CBD can increase serum concentrations of um, SSRIs, uh, tricyclic antidepressants. So as you can see, the cannabis plant could have some direct actions with medications you take. And I'm going to get a little bit more into this as we go in some further slides. They looked at some studies about the drug interaction between uh, different drugs and cannabis. And they found, um, here's a little take home point, uh, warfarin, uh, actually THC and CBD increases this level. So frequent cannabis use has been associated with an increased INR. So if you're on any kind of blood thinner, especially warfarin, you should really consider the uh, interaction of the drugs. And this all comes from the cytochrome 450 enzymatic system. Also, alcohol may increase THC levels. So if you drink and you use cannabis, it's going to have a more profound effect on the CB1 receptors in your brain. It could probably make you feel more euphoric. They could probably make you feel more out of balance. You'll be more forgetful and so on. Uh, theophylline, smoked cannabis can decrease theophylline levels. So this is a pro problem for asthmatics. Anyone who's an asthmatic who's on theophylline and uses cannabis may have less effect of the theophylline for bronchodilation. And also treatment for um, uh, for epilepsy, CBD has known to increase uh, clobazam levels. So you really got to consider all of this. And this is just one slide of many. Some other interactions, they have shown that a cannabis has a CNS depressant effect with alcohol, barbiturates and benzodiapines. So in other words, if you use alcohol, you use any kind of benzodiapine, you're going to have a, more of a depressant effect from the medication. Um, also, they found that uh, they did a small study where cannabis did not have an additive CNS effect when combined with opioids. So there was a little bit difference between the opioids and the benzodiapines and barbiturates with the interaction in regards to the central nervous system. I wanted to list a couple of contraindications for the use of cannabis. Uh, there's an absolute contraindication for anyone who has acute psychosis like bipolar disorder, um, severe depression, or any other unstable psychiatric condition. They found that cannabis will actually worse in it. There are people who use cannabis because they feel depressed or they feel anxiety. And if you really don't know the ratio of THC to CBD, it can exasperate the effect. For example, THC can make you more psychotic, where CBD, some studies have shown that it makes you less psychotic. Other relative contraindications include uh, cardiovascular disease, immunological disease, kidney disease, especially with acute illness. Um, some studies have shown that cannabis can exasperate uh, arrhythmias in the heart. Um, there have been studies showing that it can make you tachycardia. It can also uh, create some other arrhythmias in the heart. So if you have any underlying cardiac condition, I would strongly suggest that you don't use medical cannabis because it does have an effect on it. So let's talk about some of the impacts on different organ systems in the body. And we'll first start off with the lung because um, cannabis is smoked most of the time and you wonder what kind of impact it has. So they did a study with the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the NAINS study, and they found that people who used um, 
I would say, moderate amount of cannabis, like 20 joint years of marijuana use, they had no impact to lung function. The coronary artery risk development in young adult study, which was another cohort study, found no effects of occasional low marijuana use on pulmonary function. A Scottish study, which they looked at 500 adults who actually concurrently used tobacco products and cannabis did find impaired, impaired uh, lung function. So bottom line, if you use tobacco products and cannabis products, yes, you will have a decrease in lung function. So uh, some of the studies here have shown no kind of damage to the lung and in regard to just straight cannabis use. And what they believe is that the cannabis plant has a lot of anti-inflammatory qualities about it. And lung inflammation is the key point about how people are impacted with their studies. So if you do a pulmonary function test and you have inflammation in the lung, you will absolutely see a, that on your test. But they found that people who use moderate amounts of cannabis, moderate to low amounts of cannabis, and not smoke tobacco actually had no kind of impaired lung function. Kind of interesting. So what is the most common route of using cannabis product? And I would have to say they smoke it. And smoking cannabis could be done with a pipe. It can be done with a water pipe. It can be done with a what they call the, a joint. So there's many ways that cannabis is consumed with most of it being smoked. There's a clear evidence that smoked cannabis creates bronchitis. And why does it create bronchitis? Is because when you smoke cannabis, it's actually burning the cannabis plant and you inhale it. So you inhale this hot smoke into your lungs. And as I was telling you earlier, when you inhale smoke into your lungs that is really hot, it sort of suppresses your cilia that actually are used to mobilize uh, secretions and mobilize particles that go into your lung. So actually, you do yourself a lot of harm by actually smoking cannabis from a joint or a pipe. And I'm going to get into the next slide, which talks about using cannabis from a vapor, like in other words, you vape cannabis, and we'll get a little bit more into that. There's been at least 200 compounds that are in the smoke with cannabis, carbon monoxide, ammonia, uh, polycyclic aromic hydrocarbons, which are commonly known as TARs. And there's a lot of evidence showing that if you combine tobacco products and cannabis, it actually has a synergistic effect and it create more damage, more inflammation in the lung. So obviously I'm not a smoker myself, but if you're gonna, if you smoke tobacco and then you char start using cannabis at the same time, uh, you are really setting yourself up for some severe lung damage over the long run. But next slide, I'm going to talk about vaporization. When you think about vaporization, which is actually vaping, and I'm sure you've heard of a lot of the negative um, impacts of vaping, which comes from vitamin E acetate. So if you're a medical marijuana user and your doctor writes you a prescription and you have one of those qualifying conditions, if you're going to use cannabis, the best way to use it is to vape it. And let me tell you why. They did a survey of 6,883 cannabis users who vaped, and they compared them with the cannabis users who smoked. And what they found, there was less coughing, less wheezing, less shortness of breath, and less produ mucus production. Also, you got to remember, if you vape, the heat of the vapors is much less than using a pipe or a smoking a joint. So what happens is the cilia is not damaged. If the cilia is not damaged, you're going to be able to mobilize your secretions in your lungs as also remove the particles that come into your lungs too. Um, so vaping is a 
if you're a medical marijuana patient and you uh, have to use it and you're deciding to either smoke it or vape it, I would strongly consider vaping it. Remember, the cartridges, what caused the ARDS um, symptoms in vaping was vitamin E acetate. These were cartridges that had a solution of either nicotine or cannabis product, and they actually used this vitamin E acetate as a thickening agent. And when you smoke this thickening agent, that's what caused the ARDS symptoms. Um, another, uh, I don't want to say benefit. I'm talking about if you've got a medical marijuana card and you're getting cannabis products for your medical condition, you might as well get the best effect. And they did some analysis of the vapor that came in. So if you vape something, it gives you almost 90% THC and 10% smoke toxins. But if you smoke it, you ended up getting about 11% THC and 87% smoke toxins. So what I'm trying to say is you get a more therapeutic dose from vaping and you have less smoke toxins. So it's a great tool. And I'm not saying this for the recreational user. I am talking about someone who's on medical marijuana for a medical condition. If you're going to use cannabis products, you might as well vape it, and I would not buy the cartridge that comes with it. There are cartridges, but right now, most of the cartridges do not contain vitamin E acetate because the CDC identified that as the reason for the ARDS symptoms in the lung. What about the long-term use of cannabis products and its relationship to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD? And from the studies, most studies have found that cannabis use in moderate amounts is not associated with COPD. They did a survey of 878 adults who were over the age of 40 and found that all of these cannabis smokers really didn't have a higher rate of COPD versus non-smokers. So what they did is compared non-smokers, one who used cannabis versus one who didn't smoke anything, and they found the rate of COPD to be, to be about equal. So the reason for this could be the anti-inflammatory qualities of cannabis. Let's talk about lung cancer. Um, studies have shown that cannabis use does not appear to increase the risk of lung cancer. So what they did is they did a meta-analysis, which actually they did as a pooled meta-analysis of six case control studies in the US, Canada, UK, and New Zealand. And they looked at over 2,100 lung cancer cases, and it looked at around 3,000 controls. And the results of this study, this meta-analysis, was there's little evidence for an increased risk of lung cancer among habitual or long-term cannabis users. So again, I would contribute this to the anti-inflammatory effects of cannabis, uh, which it has. So we're going to get more into this. So they were looking at the relationship of pneumonia and cannabis use. And overall, they felt that the use of cannabis did not increase the risk of pneumonia. But there's an exception, and the exception comes with patients who are immunocompromised. So who's immunocompromised? You have your HIV patient who's immunocompromised who may use cannabis for wasting syndrome. It stimulates their appetite. Or you may have an immunocompromised patient who's on chemotherapy for cancer, and it would control their pain. It would control their app um, appetite. So the key point here is they found there's an association with pneumonia and an, immuno, and an immunocompromised patient. And they believe the reason is, is because the THC in the cannabis plant suppresses alveolar macrophage function and cause it to be replaced with the bronchial epithelium with hyperplastic mucus secreting bronchial epithelial cells in a long way. THC suppresses the alveolar macrophage function and actually causes a change in the cilia of the lung. If the cilia is damaged or goes away, you lose the effect 
of protection in the lung, which predisposes them to pneumonia. So yes, with the immunocompromised patient, there is a risk of pneumonia. Let's talk about the contamination in cannabis. And what I'm talking about contamination, I'm talking about fungal contamination or bacterial contamination. Plants are natural species. They are grown in the ground or they're grown in a pot. They need light, they need water, and they're subjected to various types of um, fungal contamination, especially Aspergillus and Penicillium species. Um, the goal with cannabis plants is they need to be grown in an area that has a uh, low humidity. And as a result of that, you'll have less mold growth. So the bottom line here is this. If you get medical marijuana and it's grown by a reputable grower, they are going to control these kind of things. If you get cannabis that you buy from the street, and I'm saying if you're a recreational user, you don't know if the cannabis plant has been contaminated with these mold species. So medical marijuana is actually better because it's regulated. When you have a cannabis that's grown by a reputable grower, they actually test it in a laboratory for fungal species and bacterial species. And the rules for this change from state to state. Some states are more stringent than others, and as a result, they have better products. So you really have to understand that getting cannabis from a dispensary who gets it from a reputable grower will control all of these things. But if you get cannabis from Joe up the street, you don't know. So also in regard to getting cannabis from a dispensary is that it probably doesn't have pesticides. Most, most cannabis grown for dispensaries are natural, they're organic, as they say organic. So this is something you should be aware of. So far during my presentation, I have not really sort of showed much damage caused by cannabis. Um, but this is one area where you may see some kind of compromise, and that has to do with cardiovascular effects. Um, the THC in the cannabis plant can cause tachycardia. Also, chronic users can get bradycardia. Um, also, cannabis use has noted to be changes in blood pressure, some patients become hypotensive, some becomes hypertensive, a whole variety of changes. Um, there's also an increased risk of uh, angina. Also, it's been shown that some patients um, get like, you know, they get some chest pain. Um, but real, there's very few cases of anyone actually having an acute MI as a result of cannabis use. Um, they also did a study where they did an 18-year 18 18 year, follow-up study where they showed no conclusive evidence that smoking marijuana increased mortality. So, but case reports have come out. Some people have shown of that there was acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, cardiomyopathy, but they're really based case studies, so there's really not good evidence there. But I would say if you have any kind of underlying cardiac condition, especially arrhythmias, um, I would strongly advise that you seek a doctor's um, guidance in regard to using cannabis products for, especially if you have um, coexisting cardiovascular effects. Because the cannabis plant um, is a plant with flowers and seeds and it actually um, creates pollen on it. So cannabis pollen inhalation has been associated with allergic rhinitis and asthma. So just like any other plant out there, it's not like this plant gives you more. Any plant, if you're allergic to pollen and you get uh, a rhinitis or you get asthma, it happens with the plant. So um, also they've shown skin exposure to plant material could be, um, some people get red swollen skin from it, not everybody, but some people who touch the plant with their hands have a hypersensitivity. Um, they actually had one case of anaphylaxis, which was reported after someone used intravenous use of cannabis. 
I don't know what the hell they were doing, um, shooting up cannabis and ingestion of hemp seed encrusted seafood. You know, hemp seed has become a common um, item in some kitchens. Many people put it on their salads. Many people actually use it to bread stuff. And actually, hemp seed is quite beneficial to you. It's uh, just like any other seed, like sesame seed or, you know, any kind of seed product. Um, Omega-3 is great, great food. But some people are allergic to hemp seed. And they found one case of that. Also, people who work industrial hemp factories, in other words, where they grow cannabis and there's like, you know, pollen in the air and there's all kinds of dust exposure, um, they get this condition called bisonosis. Bisonosis is just like COPD, except it comes from breathing in uh, dust exposure, especially organic textile dust exposure. So you get this like COPD kind of effect if you work in a factory you should wear some kind of mask while you're working you know just protect yourself these are occupational safety issues so yes there is some allergies there is some hypersensitivity and there's um that goes along with any kind of plant if you get allergic uh if you get pollen uh, in pollen season you get all oh, you know rhinitis or you get asthma or you get runny eyes it can happen with the cannabis plant i have to say this is a scary slide it's talking about cognitive function and the use of cannabis. Long-term cannabis users exhibit deficits in prospective memory and executive function. So people who use cannabis for a long period of time actually have little lapse in memory. Um, also, in depressed and non-depressed regular cannabis users, there was an inverse association between marijuana use and verbal learning function. So in other words, when you are learning, so when you're on cannabis, you, this is not the best time to learn because you're going to forget things. And especially if someone's talking to you and you're trying to absorb, like they're giving you directions and you're high on cannabis and you're trying to remember those directions, it's going to be very difficult. Also, they found that adolescents, and this is really kind of, Key patients who are under 20 years of age who use cannabis on a regular basis actually showed brain shrinkage. The brain of adolescents did not fully develop in this term of volume and size, and this can impact learning abilities. Also, another study looked at the impact of cannabis during adolescence and subsequent cognitive function, and they found that the patients or the um, adolescents who are less than 18 years of age had lower IQs. So there's are some severe cognitive functions going on, uh, impacts with cannabis use. Um, they have not found this study to be brought over to an occasional user who's an adult, which they don't see much of these deficits. But if you're going to use cannabis, this is not the same time you should be studying for your PhD or your master's. So you really have to learn to um, use cannabis. If you are a medical marijuana patient, you've got to use cannabis at the right time, especially, especially not when you're studying. And I would highly recommend that children do not use it, especially the teenagers. Anxiety and depression. There are many patients out there or many people out there who think that they have anxiety or they're depressed and I'm going to smoke a joint and I'm going to feel better. And actually, they don't know the full story. The full story is this. THC will actually increase anxiety. The flip side to that, CBD will exert an anti-anxiety effect. So basically, CBD is anxiolytic. It actually decreases anxiety. Um, in regard to depression, chronic use may increase the risk of depression, although studies are mixed. A meta-analysis of 14 studies show the weak risk. So in other words, if you're depressed and you feel cannabis is going to help you, um, it may not. I know some research out there that showed that CBD in particular without the THC may be good for anxiety as well as depression. So not the THC. The THC seems to be the bad guy, at least in the field of anxiety and depression.
What about psychosis and schizophrenia? Um, the studies are kind of weak in this area. Um, I would suggest that anyone with schizophrenia or psychosis should absolutely avoid the use of cannabis. There are some weak studies showing that CBD may uh, modulate psychosis and schizophrenia effects, but really there's not much evidence out there. So I would consider this an absolute contraindication if you have any kind of psychosis, such as bipolar, or if you're a schizophrenic, I would absolutely lean away. And if you insist on doing it, you, I think you should behoove yourself by getting a plant that is high CBD. Um, I looked at the Cochrane Systematic Review, if you're familiar with Cochrane Reviews, and they actually said, uh, in regard to cannabis and schizophrenia, they said currently evidence is insufficient to show cannabidiol as an antipsychotic effect. So what they're saying is there's not a lot of evidence showing that CBD will exert any kind of antipsychotic effect, and I would absolutely keep away from THC. So what about dependence? What about how many patients become addicted to cannabis? Addiction to cannabis is different to addiction to um, heroin. There are totally different things. Dependence on cannabis is more psychological. But they found that overall, um, dependence can be anywhere around 9%. So... Um, the prevalence of peaks around the ages of 20 to 24, and then as you get older, you feel less dependent upon it. Um, in a study of 6,917 marijuana users, 15% met the criteria for marijuana use disorder. Uh, people who met the criteria for marijuana use disorder also were correlated with weekly marijuana use, early marijuana use, other substance use disorders, substance abuse treatment, and serious psychological distress. So, bottom line, I don't think cannabis is that um, addictive. If it is addictive, it happens to about 9% of the population. It seems to happen more to younger people under the age of 20 than it does impact older adults. As people get older, their form of addiction becomes less. So, and then like I said, about if 9% get addicted and 91% don't become addicted, that's a good thing. Also, if you stop using cannabis, if you're a chronic user and you stop using it, the number one side effect is insomnia for at least, um, they said about like uh, 45 days. So what about driving and using cannabis? Um, THC will alter your perception and your psychomotor performance. What that means is that your hand-eye coordination is impacted. And they done some studies that THC will increase the risk of unsafe driving by 29%. But in alcohol, it'll increase the risk by 101%. So the bottom line is, if you're going to use cannabis products, um, you should not drive because it could impact your hand-eye skills. They actually did some tests with um, bananas on a track where they actually gave someone a test pre-cannabis use, and then they gave them the cannabis, and they drove on the same track, and they squashed some bananas. So it does impact your psychomotor performance, and you should not drive while on it, but alcohol is by far the worst. There's been a lot of reports of the use of cannabis with um, pregnant women who get morning sickness. So um, people who used cannabis before and now become pregnant, they seem not to stop. Some people get cannabis because they're vomiting, they get morning sickness. So the overall recommendation is do not use cannabis in pregnancy, it's not recommended. And part of the problem is they feel that heavy use of cannabis during pregnancy can cause early neuro development issues, including subtle cognitive impairments and decrements in executive function later in life. So it can impact your baby's brain. Um, also, um, it has been shown not to increase the risk of congenital abnormalities. 
some studies have shown a decrease in fetal growth. Some other studies have shown that babies are born preterm as a result of cannabis use. So my recommendation, do not use cannabis while you're pregnant. This slide talks about lactation and fertility. So when a mom has a baby and she decides to breastfeed the baby, cannabis use is not recommended. Basically, the THC and its metabolites are excreted in breast milk. So when a mom uses cannabis and she feeds a baby, the, this, this cannabis is gonna go to the baby. The baby who's exposed to this cannabis as a, as a feeding mechanism, ends up having lower scores on the psychomotor developmental index. That means that they are cognitive, they could have some form of cognitive impairment. Also, let's talk about fertility. Some studies have shown that when, you, when men use cannabis, they have lower testosterone and decreased sperm count. So, if you're planning on having a baby, and this message is for men, if you're planning on having a baby and you want to get your wife pregnant, I would suggest not to use cannabis because it's actually going to lower your testosterone and lower your sperm count, which will decrease your likelihood. One thing you should be aware of, a uh, side effect of chronic cannabis use, is this thing called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Basically, you have this cyclic vomiting syndrome and you end up vomiting for no reason. Many patients have been brought to the emergency room who are chronic cannabis users and they're vomiting and people are just trying to figure out exactly what's going on with that. They end up being dehydrated. They can have some kind of electrolyte abnormality because of the vomiting. They could get um, all other kinds of syndrome, weight loss and so on. They believe the reason for this is the activation of the CB1 receptor, which actually can cause gastric emptying. So because the CB1 receptor and the THC that attaches to it can create this um, gastric emptying, you end up vomiting. Um, this doesn't happen very often. It happens with a very small percentage of patients, but you should just be aware this could be one of the side effects. In summary, I want to thank you for joining me. I wanted to give you some take home points. Number one, cannabis typically does not have many severe side effects. It's actually well tolerated. Not many people become addicted. It's like, and the addiction is different than a physical addiction that comes with heroin. Um, but if you have any kind of underlying cardiovascular disease, you should consult with your physician before you decide to take it. Other adverse conditions occur with cognitive function. If you are a young student or if you are a newborn baby, you should avoid cannabis because it impacts so many different things like I mentioned before. Um, cannabis should be avoided in adolescents, pregnant women, and nursing mothers. That goes along with what I was speaking about. Also, cannabis should be avoided with those who have psychosis. If you're diagnosed with a psychotic uh, diagnosis, such as um, bipolar or severe depression, uh, you should really not use cannabis because it only can make it worse. Um, studies have shown that cannabis will impair your psychomotor driving. In other words, if you're driving your car, you may be impacted by uh, your physical uh, manifestations as, you know, going off the lines or not being or distracted. So really, you got to watch. Um, remember, I was talking about the cytochrome uh, P450 interactions, certain drugs you got to watch for. And also, um, you remember, cannabis will enhance CNS depressing effects, especially combined with alcohol, barbiturates, or benzodiapines, but probably not opioids. So there's a lot of good things to cannabis. And here's some, my, this whole lecture is about the things you got to watch for. And I hope you really enjoyed it. Here's a list of references that you may want. I mean, all of these are really good if you wanted to delve into this and learn a little bit more. And thank you very much for joining me.